Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. My name is Marcel. Um, I'm a senior developer evangelist at GitLab. And if you want to like find me online, um, I'm DNS Michi, which is DNS M I C H I. It's the lovely version of Marcel in German. Um, but it, today it's not about me. Today I want to talk about what is like observability, how can we ca gain confidence with introducing some chaos um, and everything around like um, what, what can we do with Kubernetes and around things like that. Um, from my background, I was an open source monitoring man, uh, tool maintainer um, for like a decade before joining GitLab. And um, I'm doing many, many things with metrics, Prometheus, Grafana, Kubernetes, and so on. So in this talk, we will also be looking into alerts, service level objectives, chaos engineering, maybe proving that it's always DNS, um, doing some chaos tracing or vice versa, and then also trying to look a little bit beyond observability depending on time. Um, and you might recognize that I love building Lego models, so maybe you can spot them all in my slides. Um, but before we dive in, maybe thinking of an op story why we would need monitoring or observability, um, we have potentially Kubernetes up and running, and we need to kind of understand what we should be monitoring. Um, there are like the different components. We have nodes, pods, containers, deployment services, APIs, ports, data sources, and even things I don't even know yet, probably. Um, and then someone says, well, we need monitoring because developers cannot work, deployments are broken, something is like, what should we be doing there? Is it like availability monitoring? Should we be looking into the, um, the performance and the resources, identifying the slow or the blocking deployments? Um, the classic traditional service monitoring things don't really work. We have metrics, logs, maybe even more than that. Do we need to understand everything to observe or monitor it? Um, and what are the best practices? So it can be pretty much overwhelming when you start the first time, and it needs focus at some point. So in the first iteration, let's look at metrics. Um, within Kubernetes, we have different data sources. We have service discovery. Um, luckily, in the CNCF ecosystem, we have Prometheus with um, the slash metrics endpoint being provided, being scraped, a time series database built in. We can um, calculate trends use dashboards, have service level objectives, and from there go into alerting, incidencing, and fixing, and, and coming back to everything. Um, for this like talk, this is like the huge architecture of Prometheus. I think the nice way is like integrating with the service discovery within Kubernetes, what you can use, and everything else is like um, on top of that. The other thing which is important to really get going is learning the Prometheus query language which is called PromQL, like getting the latest sample, calculating something, and even calling functions or doing comparisons, which is later on important um, for defining service level objectives and alerts. Um, there is a lot to learn. So um, I'm, I'm also, I've also added links on my slides, uh, which are already available on my website. So you can look it up later on async, similar to um, how to visualize the data within Prometheus, like the UI which comes out of the box. You can do dashboards in Grafana, for example. Um, and I've also seen that there's a new dashboard as code and GitOps style project in development at the moment, which is called Persis or Persis. Um, I don't know its current state, but I think it's worth following um, and seeing um, where this is going in the future, making our life easier. Um, Speaking of making our lives easier, um, I think the Prometheus operator and Kube Prometheus are a pretty good start to get going, um, providing everything out of the box. And the great thing is um, you also get to see um, dashboards and, and alerting, um, which means um, starting, getting started is easier, and we can see what is like going on. Um, the other thing is like when you see something, we have again, a lot of things to, to analyze. And is it now green? Is it okay? Is it healthy? What is going on? So it's nice to have all these things like node status, resource usage, deployments, and, and different other things. But it can be a little too much uh, looking at a lot of data right, right now. Um, so for example, container metrics, different integrations, um, should I be looking at the, uh, the system CPU usage um, or maybe even the pod memory usage? 
Um, another example is getting the help of the deployments with cube state metrics. Um, different ways um, to actually do that and use that. And I think a nice way it comes out of the box, but we really need to like figure out, hey, what is like going on with that? So um, the idea is to say metrics are great, but like what's next? Um, so like defining the definition of failure, like the what, then do something because maybe a threshold was violated um, or a specific rule was matched to modify and raise alerts. Um, the who, which needs to be the responsible persona and team, um, and going to the how, with, which can be like documentation for incidents, run books, um, corrective actions, and so on, um, which also means reducing the mean time to response or the mean time to resolve, depending on the definition. Um, and it got me thinking like, okay, with, uh, with Prometheus, we can integrate the alerts with Prometheus alert rules, um, send them to the alert manager, have some like grouping, um, inhibition and silences, different transports. Um, that's really awesome. So like this is provided out of the box. For Kubernetes itself, I've also found like a website which is called um, awesomeprometheusalerts.grep.to. Um, which also provides additional alerting rules which you can integrate with the Prometheus operator um, into the monitoring of, of the Kubernetes cluster and get these alerts um, ready to being fired. Now, um, integrating them into the Prometheus operator can be done with the Prometheus rule custom resource definition. It's just an example. Um, how to wrap it and not use two different configuration formats, which I think is great, especially for beginners, don't needing to learn different things. Um, in terms of an alert receiver, like can use chat, we can document the incidents in ticket and issue systems, maybe even mailing lists. Um, but at some point it can be overwhelming and the so-called alert fatigue can come up and saying, I have 10,000 alerts. Um, I have no idea what's going on and basically it's like, either mark everything as read or um, have it somewhere and the counter goes up. Um, and maybe we need sort of way of managing these incidents um, in, a, in a better way. Now the idea is like, how would I be getting an alert? Just like the, the, the visual example can be looking at the alert manager in Prometheus and see something that is something is broken, um, but I don't want to do that manually. It was like, hmm. Maybe I can break something in a fun way. So like maybe installing cube doom in the, in the production cluster and killing some ports. But I, I thought like probably um, it's not applicable for work or might not be allowed. Um, but still it can be a way of learning and breaking things in a fun way. Um, but to, to get more serious, like simulating a production incident is really hard. Um, you might be having a staging environment, you might not be having it. Um, and maybe we can sort of add automated chaos and break things in a professional way um, in order to trigger the alerts um, and to trigger the, um, to verify the service level objectives and iterate on that and make, make um, corrective actions based on what we're seeing. Um, which brings me to the idea of combining observability with chaos engineering um, and doing so-called chaos experiments. Um, and the great thing is within the cloud native ecosystem um, and, and our clusters and deployments, um, there are existing chaos frameworks already as, an, as open source projects. They allow you to define experiments. And if you want to extend everything, you have instrumentation as the case. Um, or you do it uh, the German way of chaos engineering on the right hand side, not just kidding. Um, one example I found is Chaos Mesh, or one open source project um, in the CNCF uh, landscape, which allows you to fail um, specific um, things in a Kubernetes cluster or on hosts, which can be like failing a port, um, failing the network and seeing how the application is behaving, how the entire deployment um, break HTTP, not even like the responses, but inject some headers and see what's, what's going on. Um, if you have like sort of some scheduling or some time dependent things inside, um, breaking time and NTP is, is also a good idea to see what's going on. Um, with DNS, um, I think probably everything is a DNS problem. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to see when you, when you uh, inject failures with DNS or just random responses and see how everything is 
going up or maybe even continuing to work. Um, running Chaos experiments can be done like once in Chaos Mesh, or you define a schedule. So like running, running the experiment every week in the morning, um, or like something which is defined because you also shouldn't be just running it and then say, okay, it's, now I've run it, what's next? But also taking action and also informing teams which might be affected by that. Um, if we want to generate some chaos, we can potentially start with killing some pods. Um, and this is a nice way of like seeing something. Um, the other way is like um, when the pod ends up in a crest loop back off, Kubernetes tries to heal itself. So is this like the correct chaos to really like simulate um, failure in a cluster and was like, maybe we can find something else. So thinking of more real world example, what can be done um, was coming back to DNS. Um, in, 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 uh, in a previous project, this was like six years ago or something like that, we had an application which was creating a buffer and then doing some DNS resolving and then doing some connections. And when everything worked, it kind of closed the connection again. Um, and the thing was only when DNS was failing, it was leaking the memory buffer. So like every second, one megabyte of leaks, but only when DNS is failing. We as developers couldn't really reproduce that in our system um, or on, we didn't have a staging environment. We only had our dev machines. Um, and in production, later released to the customers, it wasn't really fun to debug. Um, and really, really late, we figured out, hey, it's actually DNS which caused that problem. Um, and I think this is a nice way to really like figure out whether everything is um, working in the environment. Um, and the idea is like, how can I like break DNS? Um, a simple way to break DNS is something I learned in the recent meetup of ours, um, to scale the core DNS to the replica zero, which kind of works for achieving the result, but it breaks everything else. So I thought of like, maybe we can do that with Chaos Mesh in, in a controlled way. Um, and Chaos Mesh provides um, a type for a chaos experiment, which is called DNS Chaos, where you can, for example, then define um, the action, which should be error, so like providing NX domain um, as a DNS result, actually. Um, and then define like namespace selectors, different patterns, um, specifying which domain should be failing. So for like for this event, um, I've added events.linuxfoundation.org um, and some others. Um, and Chaos Mesh also allows you to preview um, what, what should be affected in that way. Um, and if the Wi-Fi is working, I want to try that now live and see if we can actually break things. Um, just to get an idea over here, I'm potentially just clearing this up. Um, I have some pods running, maybe, yeah. Um, and these are basically doing not much, but trying to um, allocate a buffer, doing the DNS resolver, and um, yeah, everything else should be just working fine. We're getting some IP addresses, IPv6 even, and it's working. So the other thing I need to be doing is accessing um, the Chaos Mesh dashboard and later on Prometheus and the Alert Manager. Um, when you open up Chaos Mesh, it greets you with an overview, um, nice tutorials and so on. The thing I want to do now is creating a schedule or actually like um, looking into an existing schedule. Um, the nice thing is like you can take this definition in its entirety and just apply it manually as a, as a Kubernetes YAML definition or um, just create a new schedule, for example, which we can just do now um, and import that by YAML, which means you can either use like the, the graphical UI or you go with copy paste and this. And I potentially need to rename that because it's something already exists. Can like change that. 
the schedule runs now every minute and the duration is 60 seconds, which means it runs all the time. This example is not production ready um, because it will break everything all the time. Um, but the, oops, not a good idea. I should be submitting at the bottom. And then it allows me to verify what, what will be going on. So it again shows which patterns of domains will be um, affected by that. And I can also see a preview in the default namespace, for example, which ports will be ex uh, affected by that. And at some point there is, I'm doing too many demos, um, the open observability day port over here. And when I submit this and submit it, um, I can actually then start it. Yeah, I want to confirm this because this is a breaking, it's a breaking operation. Um, and at some point, um, we should be seeing some results in that regard. Now, the thing I want to really see is um, within Prometheus, the uh, container memory usage. So, um, let me see. Need to cheat. I don't know the, the prompt kill query. Uh, out at the top of my head. Uh, and we want to see that as a graph. So right now, memory looks okay. It's just 200K, something like that. Um, but at some point, we should be seeing some, some memory going up. Um, let's see what happens. Ah, okay. So host not found, non, not non-authoritative, try again later means we are already injecting DNS failure. So at some point, we should already be leaking some memory, which hopefully, yeah, it goes up and up and up. And at some point, um, or like I've def already defined a Prometheus alert for that, when the memory usage goes beyond 10 megabytes, 10 megabytes, um, it will trigger an alert and do that. Um, this is a different container. Um, but yeah, hopefully this will work in the meantime. Let's see, we have the alert manager over here. And at some point we should be seeing container memory limit going on top. Um, if not, um, backup screenshot. Um, the idea is really like to trigger the alert and see that and, and detect that um, and being able to say, this is helpful information for me. Um, maybe something is going on with a memory leak, which can only be triggered by, by DNS chaos engineering in my environment. Um, so let's see if we were able to trigger that or not. The problem with the demos is the one thing works one minute, the other one works one minute, and this kind of adds up. Um, but let's see how many memory we're leaking already. A um, little bit over time, and me. Oh yeah, okay. Container memory limit. Um, this has been hit, and which one did it? Which one was it? One of the parts um, already. So this is now the alert, and if, if we would have been defining some service level objectives, they would also have been violated in that regard. So this can be like one way of injecting chaos and seeing that everything works or it doesn't. Um, the, uh, the demo application and all the examples are available online as open source. So if you want to use them for your own environments, um, you can totally do that. Um, the thing I want to do now or like continue with not only like the demo now, um, this is just the alert definition again. Um, documented for you to maybe try it later on. The thing is, now that we have generated some alerts and have potentially some red dashboards or something, maybe optimize or think about optimizing the alert counts, think about grouping additional context in the alerts, um, also like focusing in the, in, on the dashboard, so like using what is already available, um, correlating data, and also often reducing the amount of visible data so that teams who are like, you're getting paged potentially at 3 a.m. in the morning. 
you really need to see what's going on and how to fix it fast, because otherwise um, it's really not fun. So like how to gain confidence in that regard. Um, we can use the metrics um, from Prometheus, for example, um, define the alerts as a prompt curl query and have the service level objectives. This is kind of a step-by-step um, storyline. The other thing which is important to note is like seeing what is going on and start starting with the golden signals, like latency, traffic, um, errors, and um, saturation, um, which ha can help for ops teams or DevOps teams, SREs, um, doesn't really matter. Like having too many dashboards and alerts, like learning and documenting, and also ensuring that onboarding for new team members um, works in that sense because it can be rather overwhelming. Um, and the goal should be to immediately like, see what is important and also reduce the, the mean time to response overall. Um, if you want to go into like customizing Cube Prometheus, you need to learn JSONnet. Um, but I found it really like rather, I would say, easy or um, good documented uh, to learn. Um, you can develop your own rules and dashboards and for example, by monitoring other namespaces, adding applications. You can also create custom dashboards, adding a data source in Grafana for Prometheus, um, add a panel, add a dashboard, and even automate everything and not having to create everything by hand. Um, the other thing which is great is the um, service monitor custom resource definition provided by the Prometheus operator, which allows you to really like monitor your own applications um, and existing applications also with the, um, with the metrics endpoint. So the TLDR basically is like deploying an application. It has a metrics endpoint, just adds the service monitor CRD um, into the deployments and get even more observability data out of the box. Um, but this was a lot about metrics and um, observability is more than that. And we've already heard today, it's like six types of events um, or it's three, or it's even more than that. Um, potentially, we will be seeing a lot more types in the future. And this is observability, kind of. It's like collecting all the data, so you can ask the questions, like detecting the unknown unknowns. Um, for logs, we have a lot of decisions being made, um, so it's really hard to answer the question of what type of things do we want to see? How, how long do we want to store it? Is it helpful to see all the port logs in a central location and store petabytes of data with retention time of one year because compliance and things like that? So it's, it's really rough. With tracing, um, we get a different perspective of like adding spans with a start and end time, more context, more metadata. The problem on the other side is you need to do code changes. Developers need to be adding that to the, uh, to the code. Auto instrumentation is another thing coming up, which makes it easier. Um, but still, it's, it's challenging. Um, the great thing is, um, within the community and like going beyond vendors, working on a specification and framework with open telemetry, having the collector, um, bringing my own backends for Jaeger, uh, Jaeger for traces, for example, Prometheus for metrics, having client libraries and everyone like working together and providing um, the best for like the different languages, the different scenarios and the environments we need to like support. Um, focusing on traces like in Kubernetes, the components, I think it's in the working sending traces um, and also the applications themselves. So this is a great way to like look at a different observability data type and one thing I recently did was trying out the Open Telemetry uh, web server SDK to instrument Nginx and, and Apache, like to see when a client is sending an HTTP request, the server asks the backend, does something, and sends the client response. And it got me thinking of like, can we maybe add a chaos experiment to that? So like, slowing down the response. And I could add a sleep in my code and then deploy and then see what's ha what happens. But this isn't really like the best idea. And um, a better idea would be to use a chaos experiment for HTTP, for network, for CPU and memory stress tests um, to allow seeing what is going on. Um, and I've reproduced like one of the first things with chaos mesh to stress test the CPU and the memory for a, for a deployed Nginx container, which then sends the traces to Jaeger and the request time increased over time. I was like, oh, this is for me like the five minute success to get going. 
and, um, and to really like think about more what else could be possible with chaos engineering, with traces, maybe even more um, observability data in the future. So some other ideas which are always at the top of my head is like thinking of exemplars, like linking metrics with traces um, and being able to correlate and debug more and combining it somehow with chaos engineering. Um, and one other thought was, and I've seen it at KubeCon EU, um, aggregated trace metrics. So being able to create metrics from traces in open telemetry and again think of like, how can we trigger that with chaos engineering and other things um, combined with Kubernetes system component tracing. Okay, um, lots of things, um, but there is even more than that. Um, and I'm currently trying to learn eBPF and understanding what it actually does and how it can help. There are great ways to really think of on, on a different way to collect observability data um, and great tools to getting started. But one of the ideas was like, how, how does this like complement or fit within Prometheus metrics? How does it fit within traces? Um, can we do like the same, like defer, defining a service level objective alerts and then add some chaos engineering? And I've also like seen Cilium Tetragon was open sourced at KubeCon uh, Europe. And um, I was like, we should be combining that somehow. It needs an open standard. It needs a way to like say uh, different observability data types. Um, since my talk is too long already, um, I will be looking into this next year and I'm hoping to like find answers together and learn together in the open. Um, last but not least, um, looking from the security, security perspective into observability and chaos engineering. Um, it could be, for example, an idea like a su supply chain attack to create a chaos experiment that downloads and installs malicious software somehow combined with HTTP chaos or something like that, um, which could also be an interesting approach maybe in the future. Um, let's see about this. Now, gaining confidence, finally, um, maybe building some Lego in between. Um, so there are different types for, of chaos or chaos experiments for like SRE, Dev, Dev, uh, DevOps, um, and maybe even DevSecOps, like overloading CPU, failing DNS, um, clients that are not closing TLS connections, for example, um, container pulls not being um, successful because there are rate limits, um, and even like breaking security policies. So this is like, Potentially, there are like many, many ways to break things, um, but you should also know the limits of chaos, like avoiding chaos inception. Um, what I mean by that is like don't run everything of the chaos experiments all the time um, because it could break existing uh, workflows or team pages and things like that. And maybe think of like starting with a staging environment um, to prevent data loss because running a chaos experiment could also cause like at a certain point, maybe not a database write, and then something is really going wrong. Um, and also think of um, that chaos engineering doesn't solve all the reliability issues, but it can help you bring new perspectives into what is going on. Um, and maybe the simulated production incident becomes a little more reality. Um, if you want to do it continuously, for example, within CI CD, um, I would. I would love to have that out of the box in the future and potentially we'll build, we all will build this in some way, like having feedback in a merge request before something gets even merged to the main branch and later on released, um, making like developers and everyone use and benefit from um, observability and chaos engineering. And for example, with continuous delivery workflows, running the chaos experiments in production and having some sort of like rollback and um, ways to, to detect that. Um, it could be seen like the red team for observability test kind of either you announce it or maybe you don't announce it and see what's going to happen. Um, this is really like dependent on, on what is needed. Um, and um, the, the recap, um, I would say like bringing chaos into observability is super helpful, can be a way to like verify the alerts and service level objectives. Um, the idea is to iterate and innovate, like small, taking small steps, and also think of like what could be next. So many, many uh, folks are talking about machine learning or ML ops, and maybe we can kind 
of combine that in a, in a good way, not like Skynet. Um, it's thinking of what co what could be next. Um, since this is a lot of things to learn and look into, um, I've done a workshop recently, which is like three and a half hours um, to, to dive more into Kubernetes observability. I started O11 Life as a knowledge base, and I'm writing my newsletter, and my this slide deck is already available on my website. Okay, this was a lot. Thanks for listening, thanks for attention. Um, if we have time for questions. And yes, I think we might have some time for questions. Any questions to Michael? Yes. Yeah, M Michael, fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for mentioning Percy's. <laughs> uh, we are driving Percy's. Ah. Uh, so if you want to find more, just uh, talk to me and or come at the Chronosphere booth at G15. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. Great. Any question? Yes. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was uh, wondering the, the Chaos Mesh program that you, you showed here. Uh, I'm not familiar at all with it, but it basically messes up with whatever you wanted to mess up with. Um, does it run in a rootless environment, or do you need elevated privileges to run it? Um. I think it works in in a rootless environment. The thing I, you need to configure, for example, so I was running it in Zebra Cloud, you need to expose the container DE socket so it can kind of inject certain things in between. Um, I would need to look up exactly what it needs in the documentation. Um, the thing is, for me, when I started using or trying it out, like I started, I think, in, in April and March this year, um, using the Helm chart, and just installing it, and having the first success was really like a matter of like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and I really liked this, this first time experience of getting started and kind of feeling addicted. And um, the thing to mention is, um, it's like still like being root on the open heart kind of, so you should be using RBAC and SSO login for Chaos Mesh, which you can configure to ensure that not everyone can run a Chaos experiment because then it's like oh, I'm, I'm breaking something because I'm funny or, or maybe I'm a malicious uh, attacker or something. So really also making sure that the security for Chaos Engineering is, is, is in place. Great, thank you. Okay, any other question to Michael? Yes. By the way, I think I don't need chaos engineering in my production clusters. I have chaos built in, so <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of next level to have this this kind of uh, you know like experience and like whatever like clear um, you know everything is done on the clusters. I can play with chaos engineering on top of it. Hey, question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering with chaos engineering. Do you regularly just run it as part of a pipeline? Like, what's your process for doing or executing chaos engineering? Is it just for like SRE disaster scenarios, or do you um, run it on a regular basis? Do you run it on each deployment? Like, how do you um, implement that as part of your workflow uh, on a regular basis? I, th I would say like there are different use cases, and I know that like from from the GitLab perspective, our SREs are looking into ways of um, running chaos engineering or chaos tests for like the, the production environment on, on the SAS platform. But I'm also thinking of how can we like enable, for example, developers um, within or like, everyone using that in the CI CD workflow. Um, the thing is like running it continuously needs sort of documentation, needs ways to like what are we doing with the results of that um, chaos experiment or workflows? Um, so this needs to have like a defined workflow. If that is not possible because for some reason it generates too many costs because it can also be like you have $10,000 uh, uh, cloud bill because of chaos engineering, this is something you should prevent at all costs. Um, so it's, um, it really needs some like time to try it out and, and figure out whether it fits into your systems. Um, 
if the experiment, for example, can be a deployment into a staging environment from a merge request to pull request, CI CD and GitOps and whatnot, um, this can be helpful. If it takes too long, if it needs to run five minutes and then another five minutes and things like that, um, maybe do it more on a canary deployment basis, maybe a different branch, not, not the release branch, um, and move it out of um, the, the regular feature branch development. Um, but I think it can be helpful to really like see something in advance as a developer and not having to fix that in production and burn out because customer is calling. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're there. I think other questions can, you can go to the, and grab Michael on the corridor. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>